All right, we're live. This is happening. I've been wanting to have you on our show for about as long as I can remember. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on. For anybody who is wondering what the hell is going on, this is Sofian from uh, New Foundation, New Coin, New Life AI. Um, you know, like super genius. The whole thing arts. Now Chan is calling me. <laughs> Probably wanting to make sure that we uh, that we're good to go. I'm uh, anyway. you. Thank you so much. Oh man, thank yeah. You. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming on. So, I guess, Sofian, um, let's let's maybe just do you know a, an introduction. Maybe tell us uh, 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 you know uh, uh, about yourself and and, and sort of um, where you came from, and then we'll dig into sort of where we're at and where we're going. Yeah, sure. So, uh, hi, I'm Sofiane. I'm originally from Paris. Uh, I consider myself uh, as uh, rescued by the internet because I, I didn't really know what to do with my life uh, unless the internet would come and save it. So, uh, very grateful for that. Uh, I've been in startups since the beginning, like uh, late 90s, early 2000s, and uh, been focused on solving um always like directionally and now increasingly sharply uh the same problem which is uh, creative value coordination which we will discuss i guess uh later and uh, yeah so it, it's all about you know how to um create the perfect environment for um a thriving creative economy i'm a big believer that uh, automation is going to to basically uh, reshape the economy we will need to be less in labor and more in uh, creative uh, things. And so a lot of things have to change. Uh, school, um, workplace, the way we interact, the even definition of work and games and, and all of that is going to be uh, reshuffled. So that's, that's, my, that's my stuff. Basically, I'm passionate about that. I've been in fashion for 10 years. Before that, uh, music, entertainment, so a lot of stuff at the intersection of culture and technology. Okay, you just gave me about nine thousand things to dig in uh, there. So so thanks for that. Um, uh, before I just pulled the uh, the the uplift up though, so I wanna I wanna get some uh, some gratitudes up on the board here. Um, all right, so Tofian, what are you grateful for right now? Big for small, the internet, matter. I'm grateful for the internet. To make all of this possible, all this, all those amazing encounters, experiences. Like, can you imagine you are like in the US? I'm in Prague. I'm from Paris. The likeliness we would have met, you know, in the physical world was so low. Yet here we are. Right? Yeah. No. Th this. I think it's it's way too easy for people to. You know, especially if, if you're just like watching the news or whatever, right? Like, see those 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 really kind of shitty takes frankly that like oh the internet is ruining everything i'm like do you know how many how many human interactions are happening now in a, an extremely positive way versus 10 years ago 20 years ago like it's many many orders of magnitude more communication there's a reason why we're all staring at our phones it's because entire universes are hanging out in there just you know whenever we want them right and that's that's not to say that you know we can't sort of uh, focus on creating, you know, a balanced uh, exposure to them and healthy ways. Blah 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 blah. Fine, right? But it just, it really is. I I couldn't agree more. Like that, it, it has expanded our ability to, you know, uh, 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 communicate and create and innovate and 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 and, and just pick a word. Doesn't matter, right? It's 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 had a, a pretty intense effect on it. Uh, so, man. So many different areas to go. I kind of want to go back. Can you, you know, you say you're you're saved by the internet. Um, can you say more about that? Like, what was what was that like? Uh, like, what was the 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 transition like? How did you sort of come to that? And what was that realization like when you realized that you know it was it was going to be a, a a new path for you? Yeah, so basically I was presented with like, you know, a world where the only way to have a decent life was to be successful in academia and then, um, you know, to just like try to get a job based on your uh, your little piece of paper saying that you are smart or whatever. Right. And uh, I was terrorized. I was, I was so scared about the future because 
I, I didn't like school. It's not that I was not smart. Like actually I was offered to like jump two classes when I was, when I started school, but I was really bored. I really hated it. Um, I, I love to learn so much that if I'm forced to learn, it's like if you love eating truffles and someone is forcing you to eat truffles at some point, you will just not like it or something, or you will not want to eat it this way. Right. I like, you know, um, I know a lot of things in life should come from the inside out. And I, I'm, I'm more someone like that. I'm wired to like give and not necessarily like, you know, uh, follow or listen or so it just didn't work. It, it felt like, you know, um, intellectual um, rape or something like, you know, the being forced to learn stuff. So, yeah, I was very concerned. I thought, OK, I'm going to be 18. I dropped out even from high school uh what am i gonna do and um and then i discovered that thing the internet which initially was like more like an entertainment but then i realized there were so many opportunities to make money to meet people and so on mm -hmm. i started doing um seo a bit by accident uh, i discovered google at the very beginning it was very easy to like optimize pages and drive traffic to those pages so I would like send traffic to affiliate uh, links and, you know, uh, make a very good living even before my, my 20s. Um, yeah. And then I, I wanted to actually do something in the Internet that was a bit more meaningful than, you know, just trying to play around with the algorithms of search engines. And so I got into a, a startup called Media Plaza. Um, and I made a deal with Casa. I don't know if you remember this software. I absolutely but, do. Yeah. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so we were basically selling ringtones uh, with uh, with an affiliate marketing scheme, and the the, the concept was you could like create a whole uh, white label um, ringtone website. So uh, we would provide all the like technology. I, I remember and this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds very really cool. familiar. That's very possible because at some point we were ranked like the 300 biggest website in the world or something. We had like millions of month of daily active users. It was it was insane uh, yeah. around 2003, I think. And uh, that's you know, and and actually France has this like whole background of like post Minitel, uh, you know, pips. So for those who don't know, actually there was a, a precursor of the internet in the 80s in France called Minitel where you would have like an actual hardware that would like display uh, content based on the internet, the phone network. And huh. you would have to like type a short code, like each website had like a code, like uh, 36, 15 something, like, and you would buy that keyword from the French national operator. And then you could create services that would charge people per minute. Huh. And so, uh, yeah, you had like already like, you know, uh, tech millionaires, like in the eighties, nineties, uh, early 2000, you already had like a big scene of those people. Um, one of them is, uh, you know, the, the founder of, uh, of free, which is the biggest now operator. He completely like took over the telecom market. Another one is, um, uh, from that scene is, um, David Marcus, who was recently at, uh, at Facebook, uh, head of, uh, you know, the mobile and Libra and so on and DM before that he was president of PayPal. So yeah, uh, they all come from like this, this small group of people who all knew each other. And um, yeah, so, so that was basically uh, my transition. That's how I got into the internet. Uh, I made a deal with Casa the first three weeks after joining the startup, which made the numbers explode because we were selling ringtones on the Casa software. You had a little mm -hmm. button where, and, so we would just like create new phone numbers in each country, uh, SMS, you know, um, premium SMS, and then people would just like pop from all over the world and, uh, yeah, and driving traffic to our platform. And so, yeah, that's how I got into the, like, from purely like intuitively doing SEO and playing around to actually co-building a startup all the way to the exit and, you know, learning like the hard way, let's say, uh, you know, the, the real business and, and actually realizing that all the, the things I had been taught about, you need to have diplomas and so on. By, by working in the real world, I realized that that was actually completely uh, a myth. And, uh, and I, I, I'm trying to preach as much as possible to everyone, like, 
it's not the only way. Of course, I, I respect academia. I think it has a lot of you know benefits, but uh, it's definitely not the only way to succeed. Yeah, I completely agree, and that that kind of echoes my own story. I was uh, uh, I got to, to to University of Canada um, and was on a, a, a um, an accelerated PhD track for English, and you know ended up quitting right because it's like you know you get deep enough into that rabbit hole, and I realized like the 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 people that are teaching me can't write. If they could, they'd be doing that. Um, and so the track I was actually on was to become one of them. Like that was the most likely outcome. Um, is that I, I I end up doing that. So halfway through that, I quit, bought a guitar, bought a bus, lived in the Arctic for four years and learned how to play guitar. Smartest thing I've ever done. Because um, I ended up, you know, making uh, making money as a, a, a you know a goofball guitar player for a decade, and that was pretty good. I, you know, it was, it was it was a much better life choice. And now, and I kind of wanted to go back. I actually wrote this down to to go back to education and and automation because it's definitely something that I agree about. Uh, before we do that, though, I think like listening to because i didn't know any of that about france and that, that sort of initial sort of pre-internet kind of thing so you've had the experience with people making money on platforms in tech um and so maybe describe a little bit the or a lot of it frankly uh about the the new coin things we've, we've had you know a few conversations about it I think I have a basic understanding about it. And I definitely want to make sure that everybody can leave this conversation with that basic understanding, but I think it goes deeper. So talk about the, the new coin platform um, and, and your vision for how the, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, creators are going to be able to benefit and, and obviously how uh, the sort of the general uh, 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 users will, will benefit as well. Yeah. So there are actually uh, two stories. I think the first one is pretty, um, let's say uh, pretty generic now because it's, it's been, you know, highly publicized, uh, which is the, the concept of the creative economy. Um, so, and all the way, all the way until like 2017, 18, 19, I would say, I would talk about it to people and nobody would get it. Like I would like talk about, you know, the future is going to be about creativity and, it means we have to rethink, you know, top-down architectures to like more horizontal architectures, ecosystems. You know, and I was looking at all the patterns around around me in in the fashion industry, in uh, uh, you know, uh, developer ecosystems like the the App Store and so on, and and how you know having a massive network of developers working for themselves as opposed to trying to hiring them was like you know much more efficient because you cannot actually purchase creativity. One early signal for me was the acquisition of um, of AOL. Uh, sorry, of um, uh, of Netscape by AOL. Mm -hmm. You know, when I saw that, they thought that this is it. We bought the internet for like I think four billion or something, and actually six months later, it completely collapsed. And you know, internet explorer uh, MySpace was exactly the same way, right? Like they, yeah, they yeah. and it was around four billion actually that yeah. they they bought MySpace um, for, and MySpace. a year later, it was nothing. Yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. I, I think my space was, was half a billion, but it was still insane for that, you know, era of the internet. And so what, what I realized is that you cannot buy that thing. You know, you cannot buy the excitement and the commitment of creatives, of innovators, you know, for uh, just like a, a snapshot. You have to find ways to coordinate with them and to build, you know, uh, a symbiotic relationship. And a lot of people, actually, a lot of like old school people from like, including like the French billionaires and so on, tried to do business with um, with internet startups, but it would not work because they would just like try to do their sharky stuff, and it just doesn't work with internet people. Like, you know, engineers, creatives, product designers, and so on. If you screw them, then like, sure, they will. <laughs> they they have so many ways to just disengage. And if you don't, if you don't keep, you know. Um, uh innovating all the time and and making new assumptions and you know it it's it's a dance like everyone is moving fast everyone is running and you have to keep running you cannot buy a snapshot and be like okay now i have this position right so this is a paradigm shift in the economy in the way you know people work together in the way people interact and and so i've been theorizing a lot about this and people thought i was like you know weird or interesting but they didn't really see the concrete implication and things have started to change and, and it's gotten very exciting to me towards 2020 when uh, this this like horrible phase of COVID 
uh, kind of pushed people towards, okay, now we have all those creatives. What can they do in the digital world? The NFTs were around and, oh, yeah, there is a use case and boom, you know, and it was like kind of the internet bubble version of the creative economy where it, it was a bit wild and a lot of like weird stuff have happened in terms of, you know, price value and so on. But but that was it. And it pushed people to like have conversations and a whole nebula of thinkers kind of came together and started to theorize and create, you know, words and concepts around this thing that we now call the creative economy. So. So that's the creative economy. Uh, I could talk about it for hours, but I think that's that's something that we pretty much understand now, which is this this idea that the the line between creators and fans and communities and so on is getting blurrier. And so the economy here it, it's to move from I'm just like purchasing something from uh, brands or getting advertising to get some content, but actually become a stakeholder of this. Um, like creative wave that is happening within people, within groups, within communities. And so the, the fragmentation of ownership and so on. Uh, the thing we do with new coin um, is a bit different uh, in the sense that we don't start from, let's try to be the best crypto company. We are, we are not taking it from the, uh, from the angle of like crypto in general. Um, so we are creating an infrastructure that starts from the actual, um, a very, very specific purpose. So, you know, uh, usually blockchains are general purpose. Uh, they, they are for everything. You could do anything with it. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a clear purpose, which is what we call creative value coordination. And so creative value is very difficult to uh, to appreciate because if it's very creative, it means that it's going to make most people cringe or most people perplexed and definitely it doesn't have traction. If it does have traction, it's already, you know, mass market and it's no longer creative. So how do you prove that something has value if it doesn't have traction? There could be two reasons why it doesn't have traction, either because it's too good and people don't get it yet. Or because it's too bad and you know it will never it will never make it and so how do you make the difference if you look at the amount of followers if you look at you know all those things it doesn't give you actual cues so you have to have the skills yourself to evaluate and so if you do have the skills then it means that somehow you have um contributed to the value because you know the first 10 people who will join a new crazy idea like the first people who came to bitcoin meetups they deserve to have more than the last people from the hedge fund who just bought like at, you know, 20,000. Like it, it makes sense because you come early because you are supportive of a new idea. You somehow contributed to its success and your skill is appreciated as, you know, someone who can, you know, contribute because you evaluate. And so the coordination of this value now is the area that's uh, where we are trying to, to solve um, a major problem, let's say, which is, the, the discernment or the distinction between real creative value and people who, sp who capitalize on the, the speculative power of, you know, um, game theory. Like, yeah. you know, because some people have the skills, some people outside don't have the skills. Some people claim to have the skills and tell the ones who don't that they have a clue about what they are doing. And then people get FOMO and they are afraid to miss on the next Ethereum or on the next stuff. Yeah. And it creates those like massive, you know, uh, capital movements. And some people have built an expertise out of, you know, extracting that value. And so everyone is greedy. Like that's completely fine. I don't think we should, you know, combat, combat that. Uh, mm -hmm. That's, that's uh, kind of, you know, part of us. Like we all feel, you know, uh, like excited when there is an adventure, right? And uh, uh, playing video games is awesome. If you can also turn your points into real money, it's even better. So I don't think we want to like, you know, repress that from, from people and, and shame them into like, no, don't speculate and so on. Right. What we are trying to achieve is to use that energy and blend it with actual like support systems for real creative value. And so in order to, to do that, we had to rethink completely the architecture of Web3 um basically you know without getting too deep into it um we have um built an infrastructure that has consensus driven innovation 
So basically, uh, what I mean by that, at the infrastructure level, if you allow people to innovate in the rules, so let's say, you know, you take the FIFA, for example. So FIFA yeah. defines the rules of football, like the cage should be like this and the lines on the floor should be, you know, they, they define the standards. If you let everyone create their own football, it's going to be very difficult to coordinate. It's going to be very difficult to have an actual, you know, economy around football. Yeah, can't confirm. So, uh, so yeah, you have to like kind of, you know, agree. And so obviously you want it also to be decentralized. And so where most blockchains are like, you know, anyone can create their own football rules. So you create your little dApp and it's like a separate, you know, game and someone else here is going to create their own version. And you have all those like versions of what football is evolving in parallel. Our approach is to say, we have a definition of what football is. We are trying to make it as fair and as accurate as possible. And then we will uh, make it, you know, evolve and innovate in the form of a consensus. So a good comparison would be with open source. You can merge a new proposal or you can fork if you disagree with the community. So if you have an idea of like how to improve the code and the core, you know, community doesn't want to add it to the code base, then you can like fork the code and create your own version. And so those two mechanics are uh, valid and they are great. We believe that since the beginning of Web3, the best approach has been to allow this like, you know, siloed innovation. So everyone develops in parallel their own mechanics. We believe that now uh, the incentive is, is progressively shifting from high diversity of experiments to actual uh, consensus because there is not as many discoveries left in terms of what can be done with this technology. So the upside of like, you know, not missing out on all the potential opportunities of trying, you know, uh, things in parallel is, is reduced. And we can see that now you don't have like completely new smart contracts or concepts. Right. There was a Cumbrian explosion around 2018. And since then, you know, some models have survived like NFT markets, De DeFi protocols. So you won't see like 20 new models emerging. On the other side, there is definitely a need for uh, common ground and for, yeah, basically reaching like some kind of playbook that non-nerds, people who, you know, who are not specialists in socioeconomic and finance and, and technology would actually be able to adopt and, and learn together and create that like knowledge, knowledge base. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are we are trying to do, and we we consider that creators are not just artists. Uh, creators also include, you know, engineers, uh, thinkers, uh, finance. Like any topic that produces intellectual property is actually a part of the creative economy. So, I guess the first thing, so like the the. That consensus stuff. I actually love how you described as far as like there having been a Cambrian explosion of 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 you know concepts and ideas and, and potential functions around blockchain and crypto. Um and that that is definitely you know, there's diminishing returns there, right? So for me looking at it, like what's left is uh, you know, network effect and basically, you know, onboarding. And I'm sort of uh, uh barely paraphrasing what you were saying, right? Because you're basically creating a thing that is now um entirely focused on what people are going to need. And this is what I think people really need to understand. And, and we can go back to automation and education, the creator economy, that kind of thing. Like automation really is going to destroy almost every job that everybody can think of right now, right? Like it, it it's going to have that uh, uh, capability over the next 20 years, except for, um, you know, creativity, right? And I'm watching it in, in AI, AI art right now, right? Like it's, it's having this, you know, amazing moment. It's super fun. And but the creative impulse is still there. It's just like everybody can use it now. It's been utterly democratized, right? Like I could say, hey, I want a robot that's holding a balloon, and boom, I got like fifty thousand versions of it that are actually like pretty good, right? And so you know that's coming for everything. And so creating a platform that is then going to allow people to very dynamically, uh, you know, associate value and create community around it. Um, and, you know, I know we're going to be able to basically set up uh, uh, DAOs as uh, in that to get a consensus, right? We set up a DAO on basically anything. Um, and, and I love the idea of forking it too, right? Like, you know, at any point, um, people having the ability to, 
you know, take that project in, in a completely and totally different direction, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, iterating on the, 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 the technology or infrastructure layer, it's like now features, right? It's like how many Facebook groups are there? How many Facebook pages are there? Right. Like the, the time, you know, and just sort of times that by everything from, you know, uh, uh, NFT art projects to banks. Yeah, it's gonna be good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think that you know the um, sometimes it looks like you know when you when you put constraints, you take away freedom from people. I believe that sometimes not enough constraints actually is even worse when it comes to freedom because if you tell people you can do anything, especially you know you tell that to an artist like for example this like kind of blank page blank page anxiety that you can get as a writer. When you look at a 3D software, it's like multiplied by a trillion. You know the fact I can that you confirm. do anything. <laughs> it's so like you know it's so um, de destabilizing, let's say. And yeah. so I think like starting from from something and say okay, within those constraints, you can create anything. Uh, this is actually very empowering for for a creator. I think so. So yeah, I, I heard a lot of, you know, people who want to do their own smart contracts and who think that, oh yeah, I want to do my own stuff, that they are actually free, but, and, and yes, sure, uh, to some extent in one, you know, uh, perspective. On the other side, as everyone is creating their own uh, smart contracts, you end up like, you know, fragmenting. There is a fragmentation effect over time yep. where uh, Web3 becomes like, kind of an obfuscated economy where you cannot really see, you know, why is this asset su such price? And this one, that price, there is no actual mechanics that everyone agrees. Like kind of, you have one. Well, and, and it, it reduces, like having some kind of system that, and I've been, you know, talking back and forth about this in the metaverse, but I think it's true for, for crypto and blockchain as well. Like having some kind of glue that is like TCP IP, right? Like uh, for, for, for the internet, that protocol uh, that is a constraint ultimately, uh, but that allows everyone to communicate with everyone else. Uh, you know, that you'd think that that constraint would be bad. Like, why can't we have a million different kinds of internet? Well, that doesn't work, right? Like it's, it doesn't work at all. So to have a creator, you know, uh, economy that is going to function, absolutely requires that because i mean the, the largest group of people on earth when it comes to this are the people that have absolutely no idea what crypto is right like that that has to be the target if we're just you know trying to constantly go after uh you know the 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 small percentage of people that understand what N nfts are in crypto um i mean that that ultimately is is is, is not going to work and then we have to connect all those people together in a meaningful way to create the kind of network effect that's going to be able to compete with something like meta right because at the end of the day it's it, that that's going to be the, the 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 battle, especially you know I think about this all the time in the the metaverse space. So we have this amazing opportunity to actually be playing in that field and, and iterate in, in a meaningful way. Um, but it's going to take that. It's going to take you know partnerships with with you know every project that we can find that that uh, is doing stuff like this. Yeah, I love the fact that you know you you use twice the word meaning because I think that that's what you know it comes down to. Um, Meaning requires uh, common grounds. Uh, it's very difficult to produce meaning if we all have like different standards, different definitions of everything, and we all live in our parallel, parallel re reality. The fact that we are now, you know, speaking in English, you know, m most of the time meaning people think it's just like definitions in the dictionary. Yes, sure, that's the basics. You know, we can speak the same language, which is awesome. And but meaning goes even like beyond that. You know, it's it's a whole like. Um, meta let's say a set of uh, of references and so on and when it comes to like value if we say okay the world now is moving into the creative economy there is you know no no doubt about it it's it's already happening you know you see like all the new jobs that have been created in the last five years that didn't exist before uh you know it, it, it's it's a recursive process and new things are created on top of new things that are like those are the consequence of blockchains, which are the consequence of decentralized systems, which are the consequence of internet, which are the consequence of, of phone. And you see the acceleration, like, you know, yeah. it, it went from like, just like the ability to send, a, you know, a, some Morse message to, uh, to phone, it took, I don't know, 50 years or something. And then from like the phone to internet, another 30, 40 years. 
and then from the internet to, and now it's like every six months you have a new you know technology like information technology standard that is being formed and that people gather around and start innovating on top of and so on so th this is you know uh, it's going to be very difficult to to deny that we are moving to this general creative economy uh, both in terms of culture uh, fashion arts music but also engineering um, and so on so culture infrastructure then if we go there how do we define value and how do we prevent people from hijacking our um, you know our perception of value uh, and that's that's a big one so when can you oh i just lost him oh he's on audio okay cool you're just trying to mute uh when you say perception of value like that because i know you you've given a lot of thought to and we actually do this at uplift as well like that like that speculator energy is like a rocket fuel that will burn your rocket up right um you know it has uh, an amazing potential to, uh, uh, um, you know, have things, well, you know, you can make number go up and, 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 you know, it has a, a tendency to build on itself. And if you can't keep up with that, I mean, how many projects, even just on wax, we saw so many projects moon to absolutely ridiculous heights, um, and come down just as fast, which is like the, the, it's how this works. It's how it all works all the time. Right. Um, if you have a whole bunch of speculator money coming in, then you have dumb money following the speculator money and it just, it, it always goes the same way. So when you say, you know, trying to avoid um, having people hijack perception of value, um, can, can you maybe say more to that? Yes, yeah, sure. I think, you know, a great metaphor is like you, you, you come to a new country that you don't know and you try to like, you know, produce meaning in terms of, you know, um, let's find a cab. But what, what are the rules for the cabs in these countries? Uh, let's say, you know, in France, for example, in Paris, uh, the, the, the cab, the taxi market is completely regulated by the city of Paris. All the prices are like, you know, standardized. But in Prague, for example, it's a free market, free pricing. So. You just have to find the right company. Um, so you would have to like, you know, call a special company and it's actually much cheaper than taking a random one in the city center that could charge like five times the price and they can legally do it. But so the, the, then you get into that, that taxi and then the taxi is like taking you to like the worst bar ever because they know the city, you don't, they have an edge, an edge on you and they are getting paid to like send you to this like horrible, I don't know, street bar or something. And they are trying to get like, you know, they, they give you a free drink with a ticket. And so they are on their home and they are the predators because most other people, they are busy doing their normal life. You know, they are decent people doing in their own stuff. And kind of the same happens about crypto. You have like the, the people who are the innovators, who are the, they are too busy working, they are too busy building. And then you have like all the predators who are like waiting and they are trying to catch people who come for the value. So they come for the real value mm. and they're trying to be like, no, no, go this way, this way. There is more value there. And then right. you create like those like formal moments where you have a lot of energy and, and, and value and money that is being sucked into those like, you know, um, things. And, and to some extent, maybe sometimes those like taxi drivers are not even aware of like what they are doing. They just act act based on pure game theory they're like okay uh, i did this behavior it made me some money so i will do it again i will go a bit harder and a bit harder yeah. they don't even have the big picture they maybe don't even understand what they are doing or what's happening there they just see that if i do this i get that it works. So I'm doing it exactly right and so we have to like uh you know build by design solutions that optimize for real creative value and so that that's what we that's the area we are working on so can you can you give me an example of like what's the minimum viable product look like to take like a, an NFT art project? So actually like I was thinking about launching one this year just to kind of up you know keep my NFT creating skills because I haven't actually done it myself in a while, right? So I was thinking of because I've been playing with AI art or whatever. Like so I'm gonna start uh, you know a goofy little NFT project, um, and you know I've. I keep waiting because you know it's putting out fires at Uplift for well and and uh, uh, you know a lot of really amazing things happening at Uplift as well. It's been sort of taking my time, but now I'm kind of glad I did because like I should be launching this on Newcoin. What am I doing? So like I'll wait till you guys uh, launch this. So when you know when I start that out, 
how like how is it going to be different um so that you know we, we capture you know, that 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 real value expression and 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 capture not only for the 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 sort of content creator but for the community yeah so i, I will just talk about uh maybe general principles because it, it would be hard to give you a precise answer sure. uh, for, for for this case but what i can say is that uh first uh, there is something happening now in crypto that that uh, is very interesting because again that that's something we've been working on in our own way and now there is like a movement towards standardization there which is the reputation economy mm. the idea that um you know until now you had uh, two types of reputation providers you had um you know governments uh, very expensive you know because it's a lot of human labor to like produce like this this trust uh, to to issue uh, you know, degrees and certificates and driving license and so on. Very expensive, very, um, yeah, uh, limited, let's say, in terms of potential. And um, and then the second type was, you know, the, the corporations and especially, you know, tech giants. So tech giants have a reputation about you, uh, you know, in search or in social they know your preferences, they know who you are, they, they try to guess if you are a spam or if you are an actual content, like email providers are a great example of that. And so those reputation systems are closed and they are um, private. So they, they have the knowledge. At some point, there was actually some knowledge sharing between Google and, and, and uh, Yahoo at the very beginning. There was like some kind of alliance of like blacklist between search engines where they would like support each other fighting spam. And I was one of the spammers, so I was like very <laughs> aware of, of this back then uh, as a teenager. But um, so what happened is that uh, then it became private because it became actually um, an extremely valuable asset for those uh, companies. Because if I can filter spam better than my competitor, then I have an edge over them because all the users are going to come my way. And so it mm -hmm. became like... A, um, a competition be between reputation providers, but in a win-lose situation where I, I better know, you know, I, I better not share the information with others and so on. On the other side, so uh, the info is not uh, shared and it's not, you know, um, uh, useful for the world. It's like kind of capitalized and owned by, you know, concentrated, let's say. Yeah, and the second is that it's it's also um, uh, completely, let's say, violating people's privacy. So you had those like two two downsides, and so now the new um, version of that, what what's coming, is basically on one side giving people control over what part of their reputation they want uh, public and what part they want to keep for themselves uh, to avoid, you know, this like social credit system and stuff on the other side um now that people have control and so on and they want things to be public then this data can be used by everyone to like establish trust so you can have a trust that starts from you know one app but then you collect more trust from another app and you have all those like trust providers that are no longer uh, working against each other but who work to amplify each other mm -hmm. and so uh this uh, is very uh, helpful when you want to exit this uh, this this let's say um, version of Web three where it's all about um, money. Yeah, look at you know Bitcoin, proof of stake, most of the decentralized models. They are based on kind of a game theoretical situation where you would lose more money by being a bad actor than you know. Uh, and so this thing works for pure protocols because it's very like one and zero. It's like either you, you put the right block or not. Yeah. But when it comes to like forming trust around creative value and things like that, you, you, it's not that simple. And so the pure money model doesn't work. Like people will just like buy tons of tokens, join a DAO, use that money to like vote something that goes in their personal interest, like kind of hostile takeovers and yeah. so on. Uh, and so that's why people hate DAOs currently. Uh, they've been, you know, burned a lot by all those problems. And so what identity brings and this type of, you know, reputation economy is that you can have a pseudonym. It's not you necessarily. It's just a persona that you create on the internet. That pseudonym has accumulated a certain trust that is not related to how much money you have, but more 
some like more meaningful interactions with others. And then uh, as you have this reputation, you can get access to things that, uh, you know, that, that give you advantages and that, uh, so, so having this as part of the mix is like going to make it much healthier. Mm. Uh, the second part is, is more in the mechanism design. Okay. So as I, I, I chat with Mark from, uh, from, from icon, we sort of got into that, the, the same, um, the same vein. And I think you're right. The, the amount of value that is on the table from, um, the ability for us to collaborate in meaningful ways to, to produce, you know, whatever kind of results, right? Like, and that's like the, the uplift DAO has been awesome, um, to sort of, experience for me to experience for the first time you know what that has been looking like and you know it's come up that you know th there's there's like i automatically you know have a a bias for people that um can you know uh dox themselves just because there really is that um uh, such a, a, a um that whole you know kind of predator space and the, the, the you know trying to figure out how to how to uh, gain some semblance of, of of trust but i really like the idea that you know a developer who wanted to, to 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 stay anonymous could still have produced really amazing, awesome work uh, for twenty other DAOs, right? Especially like five years from now, ten years from now, um, could have built up like an absolutely uh, picture perfect reputation in the space, uh, and and the ability to carry that in a in a, a decentralized way, and for people to kind of own their own data around that. Um, it really does. I agree. It seems like a, a game changer and you're sort of setting it up from, I would assume it seems like to me anyway, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but, um, it seems like you're setting it up at the infrastructure layer so that it can't, um, be a commodity that is owned by a Google and then basically behind a paywall. Um, and, and, you know, sort of, cause I know it's been described as sort of like big data mining. It's just kind of described as modern oil or whatever. Right. So if we also own that, then, people can start iterating on on how to you know enhance the, the ability of it and, and create more value from it yeah i think that there is still you know an incentive for uh, system developers system designers and so on i think the the real question is do we want to go towards more and more concentration uh, or do we want to go towards you know open standards and coordination mm -hmm. i think once again you know the more decentralized we want to be the more tidy we have to be about you know the way we coordinate like you know the, the reason why google came to web one in the first place is that html pages were very unstructured it was very you know chaotic all those pages had different like you know styles and so on w3c tried to like you know establish some standards but people didn't follow them mm -hmm. and then what eventually happened was uh, it created a vacuum for someone to come and say, Hey, I'm going to, you know, index all those like in unstructured data, put them in a nice database and then give you a way to like search by keywords and find whatever you want. And that's, you know, organize the, the, the world's information and make it publicly available and useful or something like that. You know, the mission statement of Google, right. it was a vacuum for like centralization. And, and that's how we got to the point where, you know, People uh, like my dad, for example, would just not make the difference between Google and the internet. So he's like, I'm just searching on the internet. He doesn't even realize that it's a private company. Right. And uh, the same about social. It started also in very unstructured way with like, you know, lots of, you know, APIs, like the kind of mashable web with like RSS uh, feed burner, for example, for RSS and Flickr mm -hmm. for uh, pictures. And you would have like 200 different apps to use web two. And then Facebook came and they said, Hmm, you, you cannot find a standard to coordinate. I'm going to be the standard and I'm going to take over. And they, they did the same can happen to web three. It already has the signs of it. You know, all those like players that are, um, acting as like a layer on top of web of web three. Um, people who, you know, uh, use web three currently are not necessarily, uh, on like using web three. They are just like using a proxy that operates with web three. And so we have to, uh, to be mindful about that and, and find ways to, to keep the decentralization. And for that, we need to agree on mechanics. We need to agree on, uh, you know, we're, like we need standards basically. Yeah. And so, I mean, we're basically, you're baking 
those kind of standards into uh, uh, into Newcoin, um, and you know we can plug into that. Can you actually? So we we've talked a little bit about. I actually want to uh, dig into to uh, um, um, education a little bit more because I have been thinking about that in the last little while. But where? Um, and Chan was telling me you guys are, are planning on going, and I don't know how much you can talk about this or not. I might hopefully not speaking out of turn on this, but um, going kind of multi, multi, like connecting to multi chains or multi platforms, right? So like the the new coin system, you're sort of designing it from the the ground up to attach itself to other blockchains. Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? Yes, so there, there are multiple uh, levels to this conversation. Um, so the first one is like, there are things that are like super universal uh, things such as, you know, assets, like, you know, NFTs, fungible tokens, and so on. Those, there is no real problem around that because, you know, uh, we have bridges coming and if the goal is to like say one asset here, one asset there without any mechanics, just the asset itself, it's working pretty well. Um, even though bridges could be more secure, I think we are going to find solutions to that. The second, uh, another example of very universal stuff is like the decentralized identifiers, the verifiable credentials, like all those things that that are like very, uh, let's say, um, um, based on you know the the, the building blocks. Then it gets a bit more complex when you want to tie. Um, additional rules to those assets. So let's say, for example, you have an NFT collection and this NFT collection has like some percentage that needs to go to some creators who have co-created something. And then uh, this thing goes through a bridge into another blockchain and then poof, the realities are gone and uh, that's it. And so you even have like uh, platforms that allow you to clean up the realities. Like basically you send your NFT there, they send it back to you and it has no longer the realities. So you can like make more profit on top of it. And so obviously creatives don't like this, uh, which is understandable. And so the way the way forward here is to say, okay, we're going to work on IBC and bridging and so on. But we need also to make sure that if there is a deal and this deal has like some conditions, you know, like take for example, copyrights, you know, when you have like copyrights agreements between nations, uh, they, they kind of, you know, um, patents, for example, uh, they, they, they create alliances where they say, okay, I recognize your patents, you recognize my patents, and we will enforce the same patents from your country in our country. If there is, you know, a legal uh, battle, we will like apply the, the same standards as, you, as your country. Yeah. This obviously is like uh, very difficult to do between countries because it's a huge you know, amount of bureaucracy and, and humans and perceptions and also like, you know, um, power struggles between different like blocks and so on. But I think with blockchains, there is a, a huge incentive to do so because the, the blockchains that will say, okay, now um, your protocol is deployed into our blockchain and the way people expect this transaction to go is going to be, you know, respected on the other side. Uh, then you have like um, a big incentive. Users will want to use it more. Creators will want to go more into this kind of, you know, uh, platforms. And so it will drive, you know, through free market competition. Blockchains will be driven by, you know, being driven by profit. They will comply with with those standards. And so. We are on the creative economy side, um, and this is like, you know, as I said at the beginning, we have a purpose that is very specific. We are not trying to be a crypto, but we are driven by how do we discern real creative value and allow coordination of value between all the stakeholders. And so we have designed like some set of mechanics that will keep evolving, and then we will uh, bridge them with like all the other blockchains. So our goal is to, um, yeah, to be completely uh, uh, an omni-chain smart uh, network uh, in the sense that it's not just a network of, uh, of assets, but it's a network of smart assets that have rules that are preserved no matter where the asset is running. Right. I mean, that, that is, that's the TCP IP of Web3 right there. Like that's the, like how you create the standard that allows for people to actually start flourishing in a way that uh, that makes sense. That's that's amazing. And really, like, you know, as somebody who thinks about artificial intelligence probably too much, um, you know, the, the, that creator economy, I just want to remind people, like, that this is where, like, the, the only thing that, you know, we as hyper-intelligent monkeys 
are going to be good for is that creative impulse. Um, you know, the, 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 and I think that kind of comes from kind of wanting, right? Like you can, um, you know, make something that you know, you're, you feel compelled or you th- feel has meaning and then somebody else gets to go, Hey, I also like that or want that. Right. Um, and you know, that's, that's what's left when AI takes over all of the, the, uh, uh, the menial stuff, right. Or even the scientific stuff, like, you know, that, that human impulse to desire, uh, things is, is going to be the, the, the main thing left that will be fueling the, the creator economy. And like 10 years from now, that, that's going to be like a significant percentage of the GDP of the planet, right? Like it's just, it's, it's only going to be growing exponentially for, for at least the next decade. So it's really, really exciting to me that people like you are thinking about how to, uh, you know, create an equitable system um, that, you know, I think, you know, the, the, that I like, I like how you described, you know, the, the fact that, you know, sometimes you have situations where you have that sort of centralizing vacuum, right? Like if you create a, 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 a vacuum for stuff um, or, or just a space for things, then centralization will, will suck it up. Right. Which is totally true. So creating as much of a backbone as possible to recreate. Cause that's really like the internet at the beginning started out as like a pretty altruistic thing and maintained enough of it to produce a, a, you know, a pretty amazing outcome. Yeah, exactly. I think that, you know, all those things will just accelerate due to the compound effect and the, the recursiveness uh, of this, you know, like culture built on top of the technology that itself is based on a culture. When you get to that point, which is what we have now with Web3 and, and AI, those things are like cultures that influence the technology that then influences culture. Mm. When, you know, when you look at like TikTok Reels and how, you know, it influences culture and then it basically creates new behaviors that make, you know, influencers, for example, like what are those people, you know, uh, like trying to catch your attention, like within a split second and they have developed like a a superpower because the algorithm told them so. And then they have become, you know, those like geniuses at like keeping your attention on the screen. And and then you end up like, wow, how did I spend four hours on TikTok? You know, like, (laughs) like, lose completely sense of time and stuff. They are like hypnotists somehow and the AI collaborating with them, you know, the AI yeah. and the, the, the hypnotists are like, you know, and so, so crypto has like obviously a very different, you know, mindset. It's much more about, you know, impact. And even though you have a lot of, you know, this like gambling behavior that we covered, but I think crypto comes from like a much, even if you, if you think about the, 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 how to say the nature of innovation that crypto brings. Crypto is not creating new interfaces. It's not a new gadget. It's not a new thing that gives a new experience. From the outside, it actually looks exactly the same. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's still, you know, a database with a number, the number goes up, number goes down. It's like, it looks completely uninnovative. But the innovation is actually in the in the background. The innovation is on the how it's done. We want it to be the same, but more ethical. We don't want to distract people with new things all over the place, but we want to keep go back to the basic things like democracy, identity, trading, and so on, but have like built-in ethics and built-in. And so that, that's the mindset of, of Web3. And so I don't know where, where this, this thought process started, but uh, just to conclude on this, Crypto people are driving a culture that wants to make a better world that will then give the ground for like more crypto innovation and so on and so forth. And it will just create a new type of culture, a new type of people, which create a new type of technology. And so uh, that's very exciting. So that like likening that back to the the recursive thing where the algorithm is training the people on TikTok and the TikTok yeah. people are training the algorithm um, and, and that produces some weird fucking dancing on TikTok, frankly, but like, <laughs> like the, I, I had never crystallized it before around web three, anywhere near as succinctly as you just did, um, where, you know, the, the initial boundary condition of crypto is that, you know, we think that there is a more ethical and fair way to do value and collaboration. Right. Um, starting with the Bitcoin. And I, the second that I realized that like, it's like the, the first thought I had around Bitcoin governments are going to shut it down. And then the second thought was, wait a minute, why haven't governments shut it down? Oh, they can't. Like, that's like all the marbles, right? Like that one thing, the universe or our like human civilization hadn't really ever seen anything like that before. Like, what do you mean? Like math can just 
tell governments to get stuffed and there's nothing they can do? Huh. Now we're sitting in this situation where, you know, and that's just creating trust, right? Like that, you know, that trustlessness thing or whatever, we can sort of outsource that to, to, to math and create a system where, where, you know, suddenly like fiat currencies, which are going to be around for a long time, it's going to be a thing, right? But that's not the only way that this can be produced. And that's just around money. Money isn't the only thing, right? Like being able to sort of even strip the the idea of value away from money is starting to happen more and more, right? People are trading more in NFTs, more in game assets, right? Like say more in, in, in creative assets. Um, and, you know, that as they become more fungible and more transferable, uh, especially around these new open standards, right? And then we plug AI into that and create a recursive system where, where you know, those behaviors are... You know, that, it's exactly to your point, right? I'm going to be thinking about this for a while now. Damn you, Sofian. <clears throat> I got too much to do to be nerding out. But uh, this is exactly what I wanted from this conversation, though, for the record. <laughs> the, the idea that we can create a, 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 um, a machine that is an expression of our desire to make a more ethical and fair way for human beings to collaborate. And then, you know, plug that into a learning uh, uh, algorithm that can recursively improve that system so that we want to be more fair and more ethical and still be creating nonstop like the creative monkeys that we are right um you know that i mean that's the future timeline that i want to step into so thank you for the work that you're doing i guess is what i'm saying awesome it feels like a really big deal to me like you know yeah it's it's so funny you know when when you think about like the you know the the scale of the kind of stuff we are working on, we may be not realizing, you know, uh, sometimes, like sometimes I speak to people who are like, but you are talking about like disrupting social media and, and nation states and this and that. And like this, is, and, and I'm like, no, no, I'm just doing some like software stuff, you know, for uh, sometimes yeah, you just don't, don't realize. Also, that. It's funny. We, I was at this uh, uh, singularity net symposium, uh, Russell chorus. If you haven't met Russell, you, you should, he's awesome. Uh, invited me to that when we were all up there for NFT NYC. And, and this one project was basically talking about going in and, and, and creating, um, you know, a situation where they'll come into you, you know, if you have an information job, they'll come in and they'll track everything that you do and they'll record it all. And they'll basically create this, uh, uh, this schematic of you as your work persona uh, that could then train the next person. Right. Um, and the person who does that work, like you would get a percentage, you would sort of own, a percentage of creating that archetype that would exist and be able to be copied infinitely, right? And so, you know, I'm talking to Russell afterwards and I talked to them afterwards, like, dude, this is the end of work. This is not like some little thing where like they can just create a more efficient thing in an information business. If they can create an AI that will be able to train the next person, remove the person and that's it, right? And so like one employee, one time, we'll get a little bit of money for training this machine and then it's finished. And I, I brought that up to the, to, to the guys that were talking about that. No, like, uh, we'll still have ownership. I'm like, no dude, like if you make any of this work at all, it's finished. Everyone in the entire sector of information economy is done. And they, and they didn't really get it. And even like you know, with the, the uplift, right? Like we're, we're uh, reframing and we're doing a whole bunch of stuff. And, and I'm constantly thinking like, how do we be the platform instead of the product? Um, and you know, so far we haven't succeeded at that at all, except that we can move platforms. You know, we're moving from Minecraft to Mindtest, so there's like basic functionality there. But I think there's a lot more to go. But we're very seriously planning out how to create artificially intelligent uh, NPCs that you will own and train. They'll just talk to you and do stuff, and like that's just a thing we get to do now, right? Like an NPC that is attached to like a GPT three language simulator. But then it's also a bot that can build for you. And pretty soon, like, you're just going to be able to... And we're close to figuring this out, right? Like, the, this is where, you know, you're telling your your little AI buddy, hey, can you go build me a castle? Like, well, do you, what kind of castle do you want? And it'll go to the 3D art generator that's around there, map that into voxels, and build it for you. Like, that, like, we could be doing that by next year. This is nuts. And then we're training. Like, and this is kind of the underlying thing for me. I want to get to that point where people are individually training their 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 AI constructs, um, because then I think we can inject 
values into that like gratitude practice and, and community and things like that because i think like ultimately all of this is is training the artificial intelligence that comes after us right so if we can have any positive effect on on you know that that training thing and have a whole lot of fun doing it and you know uh, be embedded in the career economy while we're doing it like some heady shit like i it's not where i thought i would be when i was playing guitar two and a half years ago Kind of reminds me of this, you know, um, uh, quote. I, I forgot who said. I think it was Carl Jung who said, "You don't have ideas; ideas have you, and they use basically you uh, to to execute themselves in the in the real world." And that that's something I find fascinating because when you look at you know blockchain and AI, those those things could be seen as like people having ideas. Or it could look like those things want to manifest. And so, so you know, one example is, uh, or one uh, nice metaphor is uh, uh, Demolition Man. You know, when Demolition Man, uh, do you know this movie with uh, oh, yeah. Sir Stallone and Wes? It's, 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 it's part of the Wayback Machine, but I definitely remember it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you have this, like, bad guy that has been cryogenized and then he's, like, you know, re re reanimated or something in the future. And in the future, everyone is nice and you don't have criminals anymore. And everyone is, like, so cute and, and friendly and so on that they have to decryogenize also a, a cop from the 80s so that he's the only one who has the level of violence required to, like, face, you know, this, uh, this bad guy from the 80s. And then they are, like, you know... and. Kind of same, the opposite with Terminator, where you have like the, the bad guy who comes from the future and they bring the good robot from the future to kill the bad robot from the future and so on. Like Terminator 2, I think. Uh, like the Trotty becomes like the good guy and so on. It feels to me like, you know, you look at, uh, at like AI and how it has taken the brain and, uh, you know, the, 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 the power, the brain power, let's say, of like, you know, people who work at Facebook, Google, and so on, who are literally building behavioral modification machines to mm -hmm. sell ads. And, and they are completely changing the world. Like everything, you know, we, we, we rely on democracy and so on. You can completely forget about it. Now it's completely run by people who design algorithms for those, for those brands. But I don't even think that those people are actually the ones doing it. I think the algorithms are guiding them towards these, those behaviors. And then you look at regulators trying to be like, you know, handling this, like asking questions to like Zuckerberg, you know, like, but this thing, like, it, it does it know that I'm going in this place. And, you know, they, they know there is a problem, yeah. but they, they cannot point what exactly is the problem. And the problem is that we have this like crazy thing that's happening that is completely out of our control. And then you have this other thing that's happening on the opposite side of the spectrum, which is crypto which comes and kind of rebalances in the same way as, you know, mm. the, the bad guy from the past who comes to like rebalance the bad guy from the future, or, you know, like the Wesley Snipes and Stallone or Trozzi with the other guy from Terminator 2. Yeah. Like, you know, those like entities that are like kind of balancing one another and yeah, like final uh, thoughts. Um, I find fascinating how we live in perpetual balance between the best is happening and the worst is happening exactly at the same time. And it's like moving faster in both directions at the same time. It's like the world looks increasingly chaotic and increasingly harmonious. And yeah, that's... <laughs> that's that's the perfect mic drop. I hope you come back really, really soon. Um, it's Yeah, it, it you're absolutely right, right? And, and thinking about, you know, crypto i think we talk about like data ownership and some of the some of the sort of fundamental things but you're right i mean that even you know uh, zuckerberg on uh, rogan was talking about the fact that they you know um uh, actually turned down and of course there's, they've been running experiments all the time actually somebody released an article about like linkedin you know running social experiments on people five years ago i'm like shut the fuck up they're running social experiments on all of us all the time it's what they are like that literally every a b decision they make is like should we make people happier or not happier like should we make them click this button it's all just just shit your pants right but he, he you know sort of almost flippantly was talking about the fact that they're deprioritizing anything that creates an anger reaction just that like just sit with that for a minute right like you know you're you're taking it down to 
I mean, like, and I said this on Facebook, it made a bunch of uh, uh, people very angry. So I've been super critical of, of Zuckerberg as well, right? Because creating this thing that's effectively able to and destroying democracy, like just blithely. And they just like, oh, we did that? Like, oh, we, whatever, right? But I think in the future, we might be able to look back and say that the decision that they made at Facebook increased core happiness of human civilization more than anything else ever, right? Just by saying like, well, what if we just didn't show anyone shit that made them mad, mad or less? It's still there. You can still go find it, but it's not going to end up in your feed that they control unilaterally, right? I mean, it's only a matter of time before AI has its, you know, a, a really good angle in on that. And then I think the ability for us to cultivate our own AIs with our own values that are, you know, providing us our own feeds on a network like, you know, uh, uh, Newcoin as an example, uh, or inside the Uplift where we're creating our own communities, right? So we're basically decentralizing the giant network of human experience. I think it's going to put us on the right side of that. But man, thank you so much. I'm like, I'm just going to go and have another coffee and write, <laughs> write some shit down. I got some stuff to think about. Wonderful. Curry, such a pleasure to chat with you as usual. Thank you so much. All right. We'll talk to you soon. See you. All right. Cheers, Sophia.